people called to the mission, not only to the mission of education, but also to the mission of justice. Uh, and achieving justice when it comes to education, as you know better than I, is going to require meeting one challenge after another after another. Walter Brueggemann, a Protestant theologian, defines prophetic imagination or transformational vision as occurring at the intersection of two elements. One he describes as criticality, which is a clear view of the world's pain, of its hurt, of its needs, coupled, he says, with a, real se with a clear sense of the world's hope, of its promise, of its possibilities. And he says it's the intersection of the two that creates the energy for transformational change. Well, far too many of our schools are the sites of needless pain. But as leaders of your union, you're called upon to provide, to be those sources of hope. And that's what Brugman's talking about, the opportunity, the need for prophetic or transformational vision. I've been asked to share a set of practices, leadership practices, that may be helpful to you in developing the leadership, organizing the people, turning their resources into the power that you need to respond to these challenges effectively. I'm going to share an approach to leadership that's best defined or rooted in three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, uh, Rabbi Hillel. He was asked, he was asked, uh, he was asked, how do I figure out what to do with my, in my life? And so he responded by saying, you've got to ask yourself three questions. The first question you've got to ask yourself is, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Now, that's not a selfish question, but it's a self-regarding question. It's saying, if you expect to lead, if you uh, propose to lead, to act on behalf of others, you better be clear about what's in it for you. What are your values? What are your resources? What is it that you bring to it? The second question he says is, ask yourself, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who and not a what is to recognize that we exist in relationship with others in this world and that our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably wrapped up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. We are relational creatures. And finally, he says, ask yourself, if not now, when? Which isn't advice to jump into moving traffic, I don't think. But what I think it is about, but I think what it is about is recognizing that rarely can we learn what we need to learn to be effective at what we hope to be effective at until we actually begin to do it. In other words, that understanding flows from action, it doesn't precede it. Otherwise, we get stuck in what Jane Adams called the snare of preparation, you know, just another uh, round of strategic planning, just another degree, just a, and finally I'll be ready, I'll have it, it'll be perfect, my plan, and then I'll launch it, and then the world will conform to it, right? Is that how it works? It's not how it works. Getting into action is, a, is fundamental to learning what we need to learn, and that's kind of scary because it means we have to get into action without having all the answers because we'll only find the answers through action. It's also important, I think, that, that he poses these questions as questions. He doesn't give answers. He doesn't say, here's the answer, folks. He responds with a set of questions. Well, why would that be? When do we need leadership? When do people say leadership matters? Is it when everything's working, everything's functioning fine, all the routines are operating well? Is that, is that it? When do people say, where's the leadership? The problems, right? The dilemmas, the, the, all that. And so it means understanding that the domain of leadership is not certainty, but uncertainty. That's pretty challenging because it means you can't have this dream of one day everything will be under control and everything will be peaceful. Well, that's just not how it works. That's challenging because it's a challenge. Because first of all, it's a challenge. We ask ourselves, do I have the skills that I need to be able to respond to these new challenges, a challenge to the hands? Can I use my resources in new ways to meet these challenges in ways I haven't used them before? It's a strategic challenge, a challenge to the head. And then there's the question of where do I get the courage? Where do I get the hopefulness? How can I inspire that in others as well as in myself? And that's a challenge to the heart. And so it's thinking of leadership in a multidimensional head, hands, heart kind of way. The definition that I've come to use for leadership, that it's about accepting responsibility, because there's a decision involved, there's a choice involved, accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve shared purpose. So this isn't a diva model of leadership. This is not leader as 
you know, sun in the sky, and if you get close enough, you get a little heat, or maybe you get burned, or something happens. But leadership is a form of social interaction, and the social interaction it's about is enabling people to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. And thinking of leadership that way, it's much less a position or a person than a practice, a way of doing things, a way of interacting about things. And because we all know of instances where people occupy positions nominally of leadership but don't lead very well. But then again, we meet people all the time in schools, in neighborhood stores, at kitchen tables who are exercising leadership all the time, but they don't have the titles and they don't have the positions. The whole point is that leadership is a practice. It's a set of practices. Organizing, which is where I learned my understanding of leadership, is, is a particular form of leadership in which the first question is not what is my issue, but who are my people? What is the problem from their perspective? What is the challenge from their perspective? And most importantly, how can I enable them to use their resources in new ways to solve the problem, to develop the capacity or the power to solve the problem? It's not about working with customers, like selling products to customers. It's not about providing services to clients. It's about turning a community into a constituency. And that word constituency is a word that really matters. It comes from Latin as well. It's a composite of constare, which means to stand together. So the idea is working with people to enable them to come together, decide together, stand together, act together, do together, and pursue their common interests. That is really where organizing comes in to the picture. Now, community organizing was not, wasn't invented by Saul Alinsky in Chicago. Even though it may not have been called that, it has a long tradition rooted in the histories of many peoples and cultures. Really, wherever people have tried to claim their humanity, rejected treatment as beasts of burden, have challenged injustice with justice, and have joined together to move from slavery to freedom. The tradition in which I was introduced to the whole idea of organizing focused on the story of, a, of an organizer named Moses, who organized some bricklayers to go on strike and make a journey from slavery to freedom. It's a deep part of the faith tradition. And then there were the Greeks, and the Greeks said, decided, well, we don't need kings anymore. We can govern ourselves. That's a civic tradition that we have inherited. And then there's the ways people have just figured out how to get together to defend themselves from the more powerful. This way of people coming together to combine their resources, to assert their interests and act effectively, which is what organizing is all about, civic tradition, faith tradition, popular tradition, and it's central to our tradition in this country, certainly as well.